Okay, so next what we want to do is uh, we talked a little bit about this grad B uh, tensor. And in some sense, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve this case. Let me put this one back for just a moment, come to think about it, uh, of this situation where we have a non-uniform or inhomogeneous electric and magnetic fields. And we want to have in mind that we have a small gyro radius approximation. So, in fact, we're going to say that the particle position is its guiding center plus this small gyration around that. So, the, I won't show you all, I won't go through all the formal details of this because it really gets to be some pretty interesting mathematics. But the basic procedure is we want to take our equation, m dv dt, good old f equals ma, as q e plus v cross b. Um, and we want to say, well, look, the velocity is really sort of this perpendicular uh, gyro motion, so called v perp naught for the moment, plus some small wiggles because I got the inhomogeneities. And we also want to say that the magnetic field is equal to some lowest order magnetic field measured at the guiding center, um, then plus uh, rho dot gradient uh, b and so forth. And we just talked a little bit about the parts of the magnetic field structure, divergence, convergence, uh, curvature, um, uh, grad B, and uh, 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 shear in the magnetic field. Well, what you end up doing is you make an onsatz again. We like onsatz as we guess the answer. You, you can do it upright, but you know uh, it takes a little longer. Uh, that in fact this delta V is composed of a drift velocity like the E cross B drift velocity or force cross B drift velocity plus a parallel motion to the magnetic field. And so then what you do is you substitute all of these expansions in and you sort of say well neglect some higher order terms. Remember dot 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 means I get tired of writing and so I won't put down all the higher order terms, right? So. And so what you get out of this is an equation that looks like this, m dv drift by dt, make that a d, plus a component along the field line of dv parallel by dt. And this is equal to q times e naught. Um, and then you have a v drift cross b naught. Um, and then, well, hmm, I'm going to run out of space here, I see, so I'll write down the next line. Then we'll have, still inside that square bracket, the v perp naught uh, cross, and then a very ugly term, uh, rho dot gradient of b, that tensor, close that, and then we have a minus m v parallel squared b dot del b. Okay, so all we've done is say, well, let's just substitute in that to lowest order we got gyro motion plus a small variation because of parallel motion and drifts, and everything's a little bit, you know, got these inhomogeneities in them. Uh, but now, by having done all this, everything, uh, this is now evaluated on the guiding center. So we're not jiggling around on the particle. We're at the center, on the guiding center, moving along the particle, along a field line. Now, this, this quantity, notice I've got a V perp naught. So that's gyro motion. Uh, that's the velocity involved in gyro motion. And the rho is the gyro motion vector. So that's how far did I deviate from a field line in my gyro motion. Now, Really, most of the time, we're not interested in the details of the gyro motion. Remember, gyro motion, the gyro frequencies were like 10 to the 8th per second, 10 to the 10th per second. And I had in mind, you know, I'd be interested in looking at a plasma like a fluorescent light bulb or something for a second or milliseconds or something sort of reasonable. So I'm surely interested in a long time scale compared to this gyro motion. So let's average. Okay, so we, av we, do, we do a gyro motion average. And then 
uh, if you do that, then I want to write down what the equation looks like. And uh, doing that gyro motion average, particularly of this term, is, is really quite a mess. Uh, it, it's um, quite a lot of algebra, as in, you know, 10, 15 pages to do up nicely. Um, so we won't go through that. But what you obtain um, is sort of the same type of equations we had, m dv drift by dt um, plus b dv parallel by dt is going to be equal to, um, turns out just q v drift cross b naught. It's a term I happen to want to keep out. And then plus something which represents the force on the guiding center. And that force on the guiding center is composed of, it turns out, uh, three terms. And I'll need to get this equation back so I can show you where they came in from. So the force on the guiding center turns out to be just the Q E naught. And the naught here means that I evaluated it at the guiding center. So this was just the usual electric field force still on the guiding center, both parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field. In addition, we'll have a what's called a mu grad B force. And this one came from averaging this V cross rho dot grad B, it turns out. This, this particular average here gives identically that term. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, here. And then also we have an mv parallel squared times b dot del b. Um, now, it turns out, uh, so let me, uh, I guess, label these. This is the E field force. This is a grad B force. So you remember of our various components of the uh, tensor gradient of the vectorial field B, the gradient of the amplitude or the modulus of B was the density of field lines. How much are they packed in there? And how does that change with radius? And this thing, uh, you have to work a little bit, and we may uh, talk about this in a moment. Uh, this actually is the curvature of the field lines. And why does it, maybe I should say, why does it come in? Well, if you look at either in this equation or in this equation, since it was the same in that equation, uh, the reason it comes in is because you've got particles moving along a field line. And if the field lines are curved or have curvature, then you have a centrifugal force. Okay, So I'm moving along. I've got the guiding center moving along. Okay, And it'll have because I'm in a curved coordinate system, I'm moving along a curved magnetic field, magnetic field with curvature, I will have a curvature force, or a centrifugal force. Yeah. Um, when you expand that in the top of the page right there, do you want a Q? Or, uh, oh, forget it. Oh, I want a Q here? I've got a Q there. And Is it in your mu term? No, turns out it's not. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, you are absolutely right. I always forget about that. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, well, okay. And the way I've written it, uh, it, it, it doesn't turn out. It, it's not there. The reason that's a good point. The reason is, if you work this out, the average, uh, as I've tried to indicate there, turns out to be minus mu over q times gradient of b. And so, uh, the q that I had, you know, it's a mu over q, and then the q is there. And I need to remind you perhaps what the magnetic moment was is, uh, namely the magnetic moment mu is defined as m v perp squared over 2b. Um, we need to know that, I guess. OK, so the idea is then that a particle, uh, this, is a, this is more or less just force is equal to mass times acceleration. But the acceleration has two components. One is a kind of perpendicular drift velocity, and the other is parallel motion. So what we next want to do is take a look at this equation in terms of its parallel motion component and its perpendicular uh, motion component. So 
Uh, first, let's deal with the parallel motion. And so I guess I'll just go on here. So let's do parallel motion. And again, how do I get the parallel component of this equation? Well, we just take b dot the equation. Okay. So what we find, and uh, I should have said that uh, v drift is, is a perpendicular drift, it turns out, but I haven't gone into detail on that. So uh, let me say b dot v drift is equal to zero, it turns out. So when I take that dot product, I get zero. I only get something there. Uh, B is this unit vector, remember, along the magnetic field locally. And so what we get is we get M dV parallel by dt is equal to, and here this is, you know, B dot B cross something, so that vanishes. So we only get B dot this force on the guiding center, which is then Q E parallel naught minus mu times b dot del b. And now there's a bit of uh, sophisticated mathematics that comes in here, but you can show that this b dot del b is equivalent to minus b cross the curl of b. So then when I take b dot something, which is b cross something, that's zero, and so we don't get anything from the curvature force along the field line. That's because the curvature force, if you remember, a curvature centrifugal force is an outward force, not a force in the direction along the field line. So that mathematics just goes with it, let's say. Now, it's convenient to write the electric field for electrostatics, and let's say assume for simplicity at the moment, that E is equal to minus grad phi. So then when we say E parallel, what we mean is B dot del uh, uh, minus B dot del phi. Okay. So our final, in some sense then, parallel equation, just to simplify it, becomes M dV parallel by dt is equal to minus Q. And we can also write this as, let's just call it minus del parallel phi and we can call this del parallel. It's just a parallel component. So it's Q del parallel phi, and then minus mu del parallel B. Now, if I didn't have this last term here, you'd look at that and you say, well, you know, I just got force uh, or um, um, acceleration, mass times acceleration is equal to the force uh, derivable from a potential. And so I'd have a particle oscillating in a potential well. What this extra term says is that, well, if the magnetic field is varying in strength along the magnetic field, there's an additional force. And let's uh, schematically talk about how that comes about and what it means, and then we'll do a little bit of uh, sort of mathematics on it. So the idea is... Uh, suppose that I have particles moving along a field line, and they're field lines that are concentrating, okay? So they're concentrating like this. Well, we had this quantity mu, which I haven't shown, but is, is a constant of the motion, mv perp squared over 2b. By the way, in this diagram, where is the magnetic field big and where is it small? Well, the magnetic field strength is how many field lines there are per unit volume or area or something like that. So the magnetic field is big over here and small over there. Okay, So I've got a gradient B in this direction. Now, it turns out that the mu is a constant of the motion, and you have to do some fancy mathematics to really show this in a complicated situation, but Chen and Bittencourt do, do it in some approximate limits. Uh, so it turns out mu is a constant of the motion. We'll come back to this next time a little bit, too. Uh, that being the case, if B goes up, I have to do something to hold mu constant. Can I change the mass? 
well, we're non-relativistic. I, I could change the mass, but I'm non-relativistic, okay? So I can't change the mass. So that means the perpendicular velocity has to go up. Was energy conserved? Well, it turns out energy is conserved. We'll come back to that, that mathematics. And so what happens is that a particle, as it gyrates around, it has a big V perp, and you remember the gyro motion, the gyro radius, V perp over omega sub c. It has a, a big rho, but as it moves into this increasing magnetic field, okay, it gets a smaller gyro radius, and what our, our guiding center force here of this minus mu grad b, which, which was, in fact, uh, the average of the V cross B force, okay, acts in such a way, so grad B is in this direction, minus mu grad B will be back in that direction. Need another color here. So there's this guiding center force, which is minus mu grad B. It's opposite to the direction. So I may well get a mirroring of this particle when it runs out of V parallel that it can use up. So, so what happens is, um, let's, let me say it in words here, um, as a particle, charged particle, moves into a region, and black's not doing so well, so we'll try another one, of increasing magnetic field strength, V perp goes up uh, to keep mu equals constant, and V parallel goes down to maintain energy conservation. And the particle mirrors off of the increasing magnetic field if the parallel velocity, in fact, goes to zero someplace along. You know, it may sneak through, so to speak. It may turn out that these field lines only converge for a while and they diverge again, and the magnetic field goes down in strength. And if it makes it over that hill, then it could, could go on. Okay, let's do a, uh, just a bit of the mathematics then that, um, that goes with this process. We were sort of almost there before we talked about the um, science involved, or the uh, physical models involved here. Um, so we had this equation, mdv parallel by dt is q del parallel phi. Now, we can also write, if we write that del parallel is, in fact, some partial with respect to some distance along a field line, uh, so this is partial by moving along the field line, then we could write our equation as m dv parallel by dt. Oh, and then we would write, by the way, v parallel would be dl by dt. So uh, we got m dv parallel by dt would then be equal to minus... Uh, Q uh, d phi by dl, and then minus mu dB by dl. And this I can write then as minus the partial with respect to L of Q phi, which is the usual potential uh, that will give me a force along, uh, that would confine a particle, plus mu B. And I can take the mu and the Q inside because they do not vary along a field line. Uh, the magnetic moment and charge of a particle are conserved quantities. Now I can construct an energy constant out of this by multiplying by V parallel, which is dL by dt. And that is to say I multiply the whole equation. Okay? And then this becomes m V parallel dV parallel by dt. Well, that's just the derivative with respect to time of mv parallel squared over 2. So this term came down to that one. And this will be equal to minus 
V parallel can then be written as the, uh, dL by dt and partial with respect to L of Q phi plus mu B. But all of this just becomes d by dt. And now what this tells me is then that d by dt of mv parallel squared over 2, whoops, off the bottom here, uh, plus, I'll take this stuff over the left-hand side, uh, q phi plus mu b is all equal to 0. And what is all that stuff in there? That's the total energy of the particle. Okay, So we just say that E is equal to the parallel kinetic energy, mv parallel squared over 2, plus the potential energy, plus a new potential energy, which has to do with this magnetic field, a mu grad B, a mu potential energy. So it's as if... You know, usually we have some arbitrary potential, V of L, and it's as if the usual potential, Q phi, is not that, but in an inhomogeneous magnetic field configuration, there's an additional one with mu B. So how do we kind of uh, sort of describe that? Well, let's take our, our little magnetic mirror case here. It's called magnetic mirror, by the way. And let's imagine we had field lines you know, that punch out like this. Okay. So these are the magnetic field lines. Um, where on this diagram is the magnetic field the smallest and the biggest? Well, it's biggest right underneath the coils, okay? Where is it sort of medium? As I go from here to here, between the coils, it's sort of medium here. And then the density of field lines falls off to an even smaller value off axis. Okay? But if I go along any particular field line, let's say this magnetic field line here, then I can make a plot of mu B of L, which would be this effective potential in which a particle will find itself trapped. Um, by virtue of this energy equals constant. And uh, what in particular I would see is that uh, my magnetic field, let's see, it's got to have a maximum here and a minimum there along a field line and then maximum. And uh, this would be the distance uh, L. And so you can see that what I'll end up with is I'll have, um, you know, depending upon my magnitude of the energy, a particle that had an energy, okay, which was at this level, if I launch him from the midplane, okay, he'll start out with some positive V parallel. I can make it okay. As I move into the mirror throat or to higher magnetic field, I keep losing V parallel. And maybe I should just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking, uh, take, uh, phi equals zero here for simplicity. And then we can write that V parallel is equal to the square root of 2 over mass times E minus mu B of L, distance along the field line. And so what I'm doing is if I move from the midplane where I am right here, I may run out of V parallel, and then the particle will actually turn and come back. Okay. So what's really happening, again, is the particle is gyrating around a field line, okay? But it keeps getting a tighter and tighter spiral. And then at some particular point, when the energy is, in fact, equal to the effective potential in this magnetic field of mu b, he will turn around. So at that point, uh, we should say that uh, we have v parallel equals 0, okay? And he mirrors at that point. And then, you know, it'll come over here, and by symmetry, it'll do the same thing on the other side, which you can't seem to make come out quite right, and he'll, you know, tighten up and that sort of thing. You can then work out the, uh, you know, the criterion 
for, um, for when he um, bounces and when this all happens. And you can show that you basically have that V parallel naught over V perp naught is equal to the square root of, turns out, the mirror ratio minus 1. Make sure I get this right. Um, and so if you look, and, and this is derived in Chen, so we won't do it here in detail. Ah, sorry, I'm off the bottom here. So that if I make a plot in velocity space, the naught means I evaluate it at the, at the midplane, L equals 0. Um, sorry, that's V perp naught and V parallel naught. And so there is some line in velocity space. And these guys are trapped in the mirror. Uh, and these are lost, or it's called a loss cone. And the slope of this line is given by uh, just this right here, that uh, v perp naught is equal to v parallel naught divided by the square root of the mirror ratio minus 1. So the idea is if I start out at the midplane and I have lots of parallel velocity, I can make it through the mirror. If I don't have enough parallel velocity at the midplane, I'll go over a ways, get tra get you know, have V parallel goes to zero because of this mirroring force, and then I'll get bounced back and I'll just sit there and oscillate. So these are the guys that are trapped. That's those guys. And these guys up here are untrapped, and those are these guys in the loss cone. Okay, so we'll quit here, and next time what we'll talk about is we'll finish up our perpendicular drifts. Uh, We've talked about the parallel parts here. Let's talk about the perpendicular guiding center drifts, or what is called the drift velocity.